Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Heidi. I'm going to, in the next uh, several minutes, outline five potential novel or disruptive paradigms that we could be working on. And having worked with EHR data for about a decade now, as one of the inception um, uh, core, uh, institutes in Emerge, we realize the value of EHR data. It's unmatched in its depth, but certainly there are weaknesses. And uh, one of them is the lack of environmental variables. So. Uh, some of the novel data sources, uh, as has been discussed throughout the day, could come from um, uh, measurements uh, that uh, patients, uh, gadgets uh, that track activity and uh, food intake. Uh, Direct-to-consumer genomic testing is becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Both uh, genotypes, um, such as 23andMe, and now companies such as Color that are offering panels for familiar hypercholesterolemia and, uh, and cancer predisposition. And these could be uh, linked to the uh, electronic health record or a data warehouse that sits on top of the electronic health record to facilitate discovery and implementation. Uh, social media, particularly in uh, conditions that are rare, could be a valuable source uh, of uh, uh, data, uh, um, both for disease information as well as variant interpretation. And then lastly, uh, family history, unfortunately, is not always uh, very well extractable from the electronic health record. And since Emerge is uh, uh, an NGRI consortium, I think this is one of the central um, uh, variables that's often needed for discovery and implementation. So patient reported family history, uh, surveys, and medication adherence are often not available in the electronic health record. So a juiced up EHR or a data warehouse uh, would um, have an ability to tap into all of these sources uh, uh, potentially through um, uh, applica application program interfaces that in turn link uh, to a data warehouse that sits on top of the EHR. And uh, I, I guess another name for this would be Sync for Science. Yeah, so it's kind of a similar paradigm. Uh, this was alluded to. So this is the next uh, innovative paradigm that I want to talk about, the, the linkage of big omic data to the EHR phenotype. So this is truly big data because you have all the data in the electronic health record with all the omic um, uh, measurements, including microbiome, genome, epigenome, transcriptome, and so forth. Uh, again, this would primarily be for discovery. But you can realize that the possibilities are endless when you match the very rich phenotypic data, not only prevalent but longitudinal, with this kind of big data to uh, enable us to do big data analytics and, uh, and further our efforts in discovery and potentially eventually into implementation. All right, so the next three paradigms relate to the main stakeholders, uh, the patients, um, the public, and the providers and payers, four Ps. So first the patients. So one of the things that we've um, noted is uh, that uh, how do patients perceive these uh, genetic results? And in particular, there was a discussion earlier about negative results. What is the dissonance that occurs when you have a positive family history and you get a negative uh, eMERGE panel? How do patients perceive pathogenic variants versus uh, genetic risk scores? Uh, we all realize the limited availability of genetic counselors, and so uh, th there's an opportunity for us to uh, investigate novel approaches to returning results, um, not only through genetic counselors, but other mechanisms, be, um, uh, be they through other providers, such as trained nurses, or through videos or other um, our websites. One of the things we learned, particularly in our myocardial infarction gene study, is that when you give patients uh, risk information about, let's say, heart attack predisposition, and you, you saw very, um, you know, lack of actually translation into um, uh, changes in behavior, whether it's diet or physical activity. And even for cancer predisposition, uh, it has been a similar story. So uh, if we measure the attitudes of patients uh, before and then their beliefs, how, do, how does that translate into the actions they take after they receive genomic information? I think that would be a, a very uh, interesting uh, aspect to study. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of family history. How do we um, try to um, facilitate um, cascade screening in, in future iterations of eMERGE? And this is currently very clunky in the clinical setting. 
You give patients uh, letters that they hope they will mail to their first degree relatives. And so we certainly are uh, several of uh, the sites uh, investigating attitudes to how patients want to uh, engage their family members and share this information. But can the electronic health record be actually used to do this? Uh, and what are the legal and policy implications? What are the HIPAA implications? Uh, I know that at uh, Kaiser they're um, doing um, a project to, 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 to identify some of these individuals because they all share the same EHR. Is this possible to facilitate this family sharing through the electronic health record? And what might be some of the novel methods to facilitate family sharing? Could there be web applications or, or smartphone applications that might facilitate instead of having to uh, put a letter in the mailbox uh, and uh, not knowing potentially the addresses? And of course, I think we need to continue to improve a patient to genomic literacy, uh, perhaps mitigate their concerns about genomic uh, test results and continue to um, try to mitigate health disparities and underserved communities. Now, can we move towards uh, 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 from the healthcare institute center data governance to patient center data governance? I think this has some very exciting possibilities. And if patients carry their own data with them, then perhaps that's a solution to interoperability issues. Uh, and some of this uh, very exciting transition potentially could, could uh, occur with help of uh, community or advocacy groups, keeping in mind that we would need to consider portability, storage, and security of such data if it's residing with patients. And so uh, apps like My Genome in an app, uh, resources like Patients Like Me or MyResults.org or uh, disease uh, foundation uh, advocacy groups could potentially um, inform us or advise us about such a transition, which would be quite novel and disruptive. Another disruptive paradigm is the other stakeholder, the, the public, uh, the community. And I think Emerge has an incredible opportunity here to partner with uh, the community to, uh, to improve uh, public health. And you know, we, we discussed the tier one genomic disorders, familiar hypercholesterolemia, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. How can we partner with state public health programs, the CDC, federally qualified health centers, and use uh, health information exchanges so that we can actually uh, reduce the burden and morbidity and mortality of these very prevalent conditions in the community. I think Emerge has a fantastic opportunity in that regard. And finally, um, uh, important stakeholders, the providers, we discussed some of their concerns. Um, I think uh, physicians are generally in favor of implementing genomic medicine. However, their most uh, common encounter with genomic medicine is a 20-page PDF, which is verbose and dense. And that really puts them off. And uh, they want to implement it, but they're concerned about the burden such a, a report when they have 20 minutes for an encounter places uh, on that encounter. So uh, they need information about the complexity. They need education. Uh, their views on CDS, we talked about that. And we've actually tried to do both qualitative and quantitative assessment of how physicians feel about such electronic health-based tools. Uh, they have questions about versioning. Some of them, those are more familiar with genomic data. They, they realize that this is dynamic, so how, how do we uh, deal with versioning? And, and medical uncertainty of tests. So if you order a test and it's negative, is it truly negative? Did, did the test company look at Dell dupes uh, and uh, structural variation? Uh, or the medical uncertainty of having a clearly pathogenic variant but a completely negative phenotype? What does that uh, entail? So those are some of the questions that we can attempt to answer, and of course, I think some of these can be alleviated by uh, decision support uh, that we talked about, uh, improving knowledge resources, and enabling tools that uh, allow patients to engage and share decision making with their patients regarding the results of their genetic tests. And finally, what are the concerns of payers? Of course, the cost of genetic testing, uh, how these tests will be covered and reimbursed. Uh, they're concerned about variable test quality. I just alluded to a panel that might look at all the uh, SNVs, but may not uh, look in depth at structural variation. And what does that mean uh, for the payer? And, uh, and we should engage payers to inform them, uh, or at least engage with them in, in terms of trying to reduce the barriers to cascade screening. I think this is uh, something that we can really make a very big impact through eMERGE. And they'll also be always be looking at data, randomized trials to demonstrate utility and cost effectiveness, and then uh, trying to model 
some of the implications, cost implications through forecasting or economic modeling. Uh, so I'm going to end here, and um, we can uh, move on to Dan, Matt.